I'm going to be recording this session. So uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining this, uh, this session with Steven Anderson to celebrate the launch of his new book. Um, my name is Cassini Nazir, uh, and I'll be your host today. I'll be answering, or excuse me, I'll be asking some questions, um, and I'll be taking your questions as we, we go through this Q&A session. So um, here's a couple of things just to get us started. So we really want this to be interactive. So if you can um, mute your microphones, um, I will I'll be asking Stephen questions here at the beginning, just to kick us off. Um, if you can put and direct your chat, your questions into the chat window, we'll pick those up here closer toward the, uh, the half hour point um, of this session. Um, Stephen, before we get started, you mentioned that there is a coupon code for, uh, for your book. It is, and that coupon code is um, UX Dallas 0520. We'll put that here in the chat window. <laughs> so UX Dallas 0520. Um, and the book's available from Rosenfeld Media. Yep. And I think that coupon code you said is valid for one month? Valid for one month. And the 20 is not for the year 2020 or, or the month 520. It's actually for 20% off. So uh, <laughs> yeah, and that, if you order it from Rosenfeld Media, which um, actually, I checked prices this morning between Rosenfeld Media and Amazon for the physical book. It's the exact same price, um, except you get 20% off here. And Rosenfeld Media for years has always done the cool thing where if you buy the physical book, it includes all the digital versions um, just by default, which I think is an amazing thing. So yeah, definitely go there. We can maybe dig up the link to Rosenfeld Media's uh, copy to go along with that code. But uh, do that. I'll the call. Um. And I, I think we've got a few, um, we've, we've got a few uh, giveaways for the book as well, Stephen. Um, so we'll, we'll jump right in. Um, I guess the, you, I read this book over the weekend, figure it out, um, getting from information to understanding. And one of the things that I really like about the book is that you say, it's not really a how-to book, but a how to think about things book. Uh, and I really like this shift in approach. Can you unpack that? Um, is this a book just for designers? Is this uh, maybe a book for uh, somebody who isn't a designer? Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about the arc and who the book is for? Yeah, I, I think early, and, and again, this book has been in development for, um, I hate to admit it, but probably closer to seven years. Um, I think early on I was thinking, uh, uh, design audience, uh, but as the writing went on, as the book took shape, it became clear that um, Carl and I were both writing for, Carl Fast, my co-author, were both writing for a broader audience. Um, and then we faced the struggle from, from day one of, was this gonna be a how-to tactical book or was it gonna be something else? And I think we were both of the same mind that we didn't wanna write a book that's all theory and theoretical. We wanted it to be something that after you read, you can go use, however, the perspective we were taking was such that it, it, there was just no way to make it a, a tactical how-to book. And there were plenty of those on the market. So we kind of landed in the middle and we say it's a, a how to think book. So after you read this, um, at a minimum, you should have a different awareness of how cognition and how, um, how our visual sense of perception, all these things work. And you should have an introduction to a vocabulary. We can start naming things and saying, ah, the problem there is with X or I can, I can do this. And so we like to say it's a book to, um, about how we create understanding, whether that's for ourselves or for others. Excellent. So it's, you know, I, I imagine a lot of folks in the, in the chat room, uh, in the Zoom room here are uh, coming from a design background. I think that non-designers will, will get an understanding of these things too. So it's very much for a, um, anybody interested in uh, sorting it out for themselves. I really like that you didn't include an exclamation point on figure it out. <laughs> Tell me more. Why, 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 uh, why do you like that detail? Um, you know, I think maybe coming from the background that I have, um, I, that was often used at, with an exclamation point, right? Of figure it out and implying yourself, right? Yep. 
And I think throughout the book, you, you kind of gently nudge us and guide us through how, how can we do that? What are modes and frameworks that we can use to, to, to think about shifting information to sort of assimilating that information, uh, which was hugely helpful for me. Um, I think there's a lot to unpack with the book too. I'm going to be rereading re certain portions of it for a while. So tell me a little bit more. You said it said took seven years to write, and you mm -hmm. had a really beautiful visualization of the changes um, of that. I have it handy. Um, yeah, you want to pull that up? That I can pull it up uh, if, if you want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, and while, and while you're pulling that up, the um, I've actually got a blog post I'm going to share in the next week or two about the origins of the title. Um, Figuring out what to call this book was actually a really hard thing. And uh, there was a point about two years ago where I, I finally arrived at the figure it out title. And I felt, it, you know, when you, when you arrive at something, you just feel in your gut is the right thing, but then you got to convince other people. And so I wrote this really long essay documenting my journey and trying and testing out different titles. I sent that to the publisher and they came back and said, yep, that's got to be the title. So anyway, I'm going to actually share what I wrote to them uh, in a Medium post in a couple of weeks. But um, yeah, I didn't want it to be the figure it out with the exclamation mark, like you said, because it's that's usually used in a phrase like, yeah, go figure it out. Go. It's it's not meant for what the words actually are suggesting. And I also like the implied figure it out. It could be um, you, Cassini, go figure it out, or we should go figure it out collectively, which is if you make your way through the entire arc of the book, it kind of ends with this collective sort of group cognition lens where figuring it out is something um, that you can't necessarily do on your own in many cases. Um, so yeah, it kind of it kind of fit the the book journey as a whole and kind of the the points we wanted to hit upon. So as I'm as I'm doing this, I realize I my system preferences don't allow me to share the screen without uh, restarting it here. Um, I'll put a link in the chat window to where you can both watch a video of Stephen talking about this, as well as download this this graphic. Um, I guess, how did the book start? Like what, what made you want to write a book about figuring things out? Um, so I think it started, I, yeah, I've been doing a lot of reflection on when did it start? Um, actually, uh, I think the forward hints at this, or sorry, the introduction hints at this, but um, doesn't go into the detail. You know, I've been drawing visual models or creating explanations throughout my whole career, going back as far as um, when I was a high school English teacher decades ago. And, uh, and so, yeah, the, whether it's visual artifacts as a designer or things like sitemaps or things like concept models, I've been doing visual explanations for a long time. And I think as early as 2008, I was being invited to give talks and workshops on my process. And I think I started becoming aware um, in the process of trying to explain my process that I really don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> like, it's kind of like that comic um, and the magic happens here. And so for me, it was a question of, okay, what is, what is it that happens there? Uh, I was spurred on a lot by Christina Whitkey and, uh, at, at an IA conference in, I want to say 2014, where she cornered me after a workshop and said, she gave me a, a, a fuzzy concept and said, I want you to, to draw this. And so I was like, okay. And so, and what she was doing was kind of reflective. She was doing research and observing me and reflecting on what was going on in my head. And she wrote an article that, um, I think how to draw a concept model or how to create a concept model out of that. Um, but that, I think that was the origins of the book, but I knew going into it that it was going to be more than concept models and visuals and pictures and things that uh, appeal to our sense of vision. Um, Cause I also knew that metaphors and stories and these other kinds of things also work when you're trying to explain something. Um, so I, that was kind of my starting point and as I was sharing with folks about this idea and what I was working on, someone said, oh, you gotta go meet Carl fast. I think you'll add a twist to what you're doing. And so um, I met with him and Carl started saying, yeah, it's not just about the stuff we see and the associations you evoke, it's also interacting with those things. I was like, okay, so tell me more. And he said, think about, think about uh, Scrabble. If you've ever played Scrabble, how many of us are rearranging the tiles like while we play and why, why are you doing that? And you know, it turns out we've rearranged the tiles to see more possibility. And so that sounds rather mundane in an everyday example, but the point there is if thinking only ever happened in the head, then we wouldn't need to rearrange the tiles because we would just do it mentally, right? Or with our, you know, internally. And then, uh, but we rearrange because we're actually using the thinking space around us. And then he took it a step further with another everyday example. Think of playing chess and you may grab a chess piece and put it out 
in the hover over the space, because you know, once you release it, it's, you're committed, right? But you hover over the space and then you decide, no, that's probably not good. And you return it to the original position. And again, the question was why? And it's because by doing that, we actually allow ourselves to think uh, more broadly. And then I started looking at things like putting sticky notes on walls, which we do in workshops and moving things around and changing perspectives. And I realized that, yeah, these interactions are a big part of, of understanding. So, so you had then prior associations, you had external representations or visuals, you have interactions and, kind of, and that's kind of the bulk of the book. And the fourth big main section was really the coordination of all those activities. And that's, um, that's kind of the journey, I, the discovery journey I went on in exploring this. And uh, it's kind of the arc of the book as you read it as well. You mentioned two games in there, both Scrabble and chess. Um, and that's one of the threads that I think is in the book. Anybody who reads, I think you could pick up any chapter and there's quite a few games that are mentioned. Can, can you talk a little bit more about that? That's yeah. So, um, <laughs> so Carl and I are both, both uh, big board game fans. Um, I think I put in a lot more of the examples about board games than he did, but I think he was full, a full on champion of those examples. But um, one of the things I've always marveled at with games is um, they, I'm going to use this word incorrectly, but they embody um, or represent a lot of what we talk about. So if you grab a deck of cards, right, um, the numbers, the, the colors, the shapes, right, they, they actually are visual representations or visual encodings, which we talk about that represent things. Um, and then there's, it's not just what's on the cards themselves. I think there's a game we refer to in the book uh, where when you put the card on the table, based on how it's rotated, you know, at 90 degree angles and going through like a whole cycle indicates the status of the card. And so there's just so much visual language in the design of these tabletop board games. Um, but more than that, if you actually look at how people play, it embodies or, or um, demonstrates a lot of the interactions. So um, I was listening to uh, the Shut Up and Sit Down podcast, game reviews, and they were talking about the game Wingspan and playing it uh, the digital version with friends versus in, in person. And they were commenting on, um, for those of you who play, play Wingspan, it's a game about collecting birds to your habitat. Um, while you're waiting for your turn, you'll often arrange cards and cubes off the board as a way to see the possibilities, kind of like with the Scrabble and chess examples. And they were lamenting the fact that in the digital version, you couldn't do that. So you, and I looked into that and they're talking about the game, but at a deeper level, like they're talking about the ability to use, uh, uh, space to use proximity to use these these cards to hold ideas to hold your plan for future moves and you you know when it comes to your turn you just have to remember that in the digital version but the physical version you could actually offload that thinking and hold those ideas and hold those plans in space right so it's I don't know, if you look at games they're just, they're just they're they're rich for everything we're talking about rich demonstrations it's funny as, as you were mentioning that i'm thinking back to playing monopoly with my brothers mm -hmm. and i learned how to cheat from playing Monopoly with my brothers, right? Obviously, you're the banker. You yep. it's the easiest way to cheat. And um, <laughs> Rachel Botsman, um, who writes a lot about trust, talks about how would the world be different if you grew up playing Tetris, right? And you mentioned that in your book as well. And you have an image of Minecraft. How would the world be different if you grew up playing Minecraft, right? There's a lot of socialization that that comes about because of this, and. Um, I, I like that you don't just sort of focus on mechanics of, of the games, you focus on how does this lead to a better understanding, right? What is the journey that we're on uh, as, as we go through this? Um, you also talk about associations. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a statement in the book that says, associations among concepts is thinking. Yep. Um, that's, <laughs> that's really profound. Um, so the sentence was again associations among concepts is thinking and you know I, I guess if you can unpack what that means and it it reminds me of a quote from a poem that I remember having to learn in high school from Tennyson uh, for it's the poem Ulysses where he says I'm a part of all that I've met right mm -hmm. everything that I've encountered is basically who I am um, so can you can you explain how associations among concepts uh, is thinking? Yeah, that, that, um, I really iterated on that phrase to get it right. And I think I hammer it out across, I think four chapters on associations. I repeat that phrase. Uh, the, when you look at whether it's telling a story or using a metaphor 
or making an aesthetic reference, all these things. I'll give some examples in a moment. They're, the reason they work is because they're activating or bringing to mind prior concepts. And so if we start kind of in the middle with um, someone like George Lakoff. He talks a lot about um, uh, our physical bodies and the whole fact that we have up and down and behind and the forward, um, these words that have these meanings that he talks about the root in our, our language, our body. So for example, um, uh, normally we would place a judge on a higher platform above us because they're authority and an authority over us. Same with kings and thrones, right? Or we talk about moving up the corporate ladder and he would say that's just, that's mirrored in our bodies and the subservience we have when we're below or above someone. Uh, so that's one example of, you know, these concepts, right? And you can, and you pick these up through, you know, just moving through the body, you pick them up from an early age, just through proprioception and reaching out and grabbing stuff. Um, so that's one, that's one view. And those, you know, that's been debated, the metaphors and the language between the body. There's, um, but it, it was a consistent with the, this broader theme of, that we were making around uh, that all these ideas or, or concepts, right? And so if you look at something, uh, if you turn to Douglas Hofstetter, for example, he talks about um, all the way down, all thinking is analogy. And there are layers upon layers of stuff that we're not even aware of. And he used a great example where he said, take some, a lot of the phrases and the, the language we use. And if you were to transplant someone from just 100 or 200 years ago into our modern world, they wouldn't understand a lot of what we're doing. So I think he used the phrase like the Paris of the West. Well, to understand that what that would mean, you'd have to know what's meant or what the associations are with Paris. You'd also have to know what's meant of the West and what that's referring to. Um, and so I think about that with just the language and the meaning and there, we have layers upon layers upon layers of meanings. Um, to bring, bring it back to something like uh, diversity and inclusion, I actually backed into this topic by way of becoming aware of and valuing people's prior experiences. So um, what I've come to believe about the world and the models I've chosen to embrace and the values I've chosen to, to value um, are a result of those every experience and every interaction I've had over my life. Same for you, Cassini, same for everyone else dialed in. So who we are is based upon the experiences we've had and our reactions to that and the feedback loop we got from those reactions. And that has shaped how we view the world and how we see things. And so I think a big part of, uh, of uh, I don't know, uh, of when, when you get near the end of the book and we talk about working together as teams and all these kinds of group cognition themes, a big part is learning to respect and value these differences and to see them as an opportunity to learn from each other and broaden our own, our own view. Um, kind of crosses over in some of the territory that Dave Gray wrote about liminal thinking. We have to kind of understand the strata upon which are all of our thoughts are built. Um, mm -hmm. I'll give one more example. I know I'm going to <laughs> for this, but this was a hard, hard section to write, the associations one. But we talk a lot about uh, visual metaphors. So for example, a common one is the iceberg, right? And what the iceberg as a concept represents is there's all the stuff we see above, but then the iceberg and all the things that really matter are below the water. Right, so that's the concept. But what's interesting is I don't have to put up a slide of the iceberg. And in fact, many of us have never seen an iceberg in person. It's the idea of the iceberg. So I just spoke about the iceberg. And some of you are thinking about, some of you brought to mind a visual of an iceberg that you've seen in a PowerPoint presentation or something. But it's not the fact that you brought the visual in, it's that the visual activated or triggered this prior concept and association. And again, to bring the point home, if you went to a rural tribe in South America that, that has never heard of the concept of an iceberg and you splashed it, it would mean, have mean nothing, right? Until you deconstructed and explained the concept. So a lot of our thinking is very, very rooted in the cultures we grew up in and the language and the interactions and things we develop over time. A very famous example that, of what you described, um, forgetting where in Africa, but um, the, no, the they say uh, a short moment is the time it takes to fry a locust. Like, yeah. I'll be back in, in a fry of a locust uh, versus the boiling of rice, which is about 20 minutes or so. Yeah. So, right, I wouldn't know what, what that means um, without a, like, somebody unpacking, unpacking them. And, and you, you know, one of the things that I really learned from the book is how you, I don't know if something is happening to my video. Here you go. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Actually, I was going to add to that. There's, um, uh, 
let me draw this really quickly. So these, these things affect us in really interesting ways. So uh, there's this optical illusion, I'm drawing it right now, where you see this line, and depending on how you look at it, I'm gonna hold this up, hopefully everyone can see it there. Uh, this, you, you tend to view one of these lines as longer than the other, even though they're identical in length. And it has to do with the direction of the arrows. I think the, uh, we tend to view the, uh, the line with the arrows going away from the line as that line is longer, even though they're identical in length. So it's an optical illusion that's been studied and researched. What's interesting is when you go and you test this optical illusion with a culture that has um, not grown up in rectangular buildings and houses, so again, the rural tribe example, it doesn't, one doesn't seem longer or shorter than the other. And when you start peeling it back, like, like I'm looking in your, your, over your shoulder, Cassini, right now, like you're in a box room, right? You're, you're in a house with, with these corners, but we grow up with um, seeing these things that um, just because of perspective and depth perception, we assume there are things that go along with it, right? And so when we look at an optical illusion, a flat line, we tend to think of one, perceive one as longer than the other. But for cultures that have never lived in houses like that or have grown up in, I don't know, round huts or things, the same perception doesn't happen, doesn't apply. So again, this idea that ideas and concepts are embedded in like just, I don't know, every interaction, every, where we grow up, it's, it's deep rooted. It's hard to be aware of that most of the time. And you give the Kiki Bobo example of the sharp lines and yep. the, the curved lines as well. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, for those who are, are, haven't heard of Kiki Bobo effect yet, it's uh, you splash up two word, two shapes, and one of them is very round and bulbous, and the other has a very sharp and pointed. And the question that's been asked across cultures for over a hundred years now is: one of these is Kiki, and one of these is Boba. Um, which one is which? And 99.9% .9 of the time, people say the sharp one is Kika, Kiki, whatever, and the other one's Booba, right? Uh, boob, not Booba, <laughs> Booba. Um, and uh, yeah, and then the question is why? And again, it's these fundamental associations between the shape of our mouth and the kind of uh, uh, sounds we make and these shapes. So again, these primary fundamental associations. Yeah, so you, <clears throat> you do note that Right, even though the world is filled with associations, uh, and you also talk about analogies, um, they're not always positive and they're not always neutral, right? Can you unpack what you mean by that a little bit more? Yeah, I think, I think a broader theme across everything is, is we pick up these analogies or metaphors or these visuals, it could even be tools we use at work, like an XY matrix or you know, Venn diagram, right? And these are all models or lenses. And um, it's as useful as they are, like it's useful to draw a Venn diagram overlap, right? Or to plot your competitors in a matrix, but it's more useful to understand that this is just a lens or a model, a way to looking at things. And the more models you accumulate, the more different associations you accumulate, the more you're able to look at a thing in its full rich complexity. And so when we use metaphors to explain something, um, it, it represents a powerful, strong way to view things. So one example, um, speaking to, uh, to a friend of mine who's an exec, having to do some layoffs, and the metaphor that was used was, are you cutting skin, are you cutting muscle, or are you cutting bone? Talking about the layoffs, and that just stuck with me. That's a powerful metaphor. But the imp implication there was if you're cutting skin, like you can grow back and heal. The company, the organization can heal from this. If you're cutting muscle, it's gonna be a lot harder. Um, you're going to be handicapped, you know, it's going to be, you're going to do some physical therapy, right, to recover from that. If you're cutting bone, good luck, right, that may permanently uh, hurt the business. And the whole point of that metaphor is to reframe the question of letting people go from, oh, just cut some people, we can rehire them later, to like, no, the way an organism works over time, and our organization is an organism, um, we have to think about the effects of this and who's being let go and, and you know, the severity of it. Um, very powerful metaphor. So on one hand, I would say, wow, that's great for a compelling, persuasive frame on the situation that um, we have to be, to, for the health of the organization, we have to think about how many people we let go and who. Um, but it's just one frame, right? It's just one way. We could come up with other metaphors to look at that and other frames. Even as I'm sharing this example, I'm like, even that metaphor like dehumanizes the, the people, the individuals involved. So the whole point is these associations are frames or lenses upon things, but they're just a frame. And so I actually have a chapter where I kind of, after three chapters of explaining 
what and how powerful these associations are, whether visual or verbal, um, in how they're triggered. Then I spend a chapter talking about things like first principles thinking and trying to clear your mind of these, these, uh, this thinking by association, which um, if it's association all the way down, as, as some academics would argue, there's a point at which you, you stop, right? <laughs> or else it's just fruitless. But I, I think oftentimes we stop with the first model or the first metaphor or the first association and don't go deeper or don't question it. And so that's the point of that that last chapter is just say, okay, after all this great stuff, let me pull the rug out from under it just so we're not um, uh, uh, walking away with the wrong ideas. So on that, you, you give an example, and maybe you can pull up uh, this page, it's page 106. Um, you use the metaphor, we, we as designers, we often use the metaphor of the three-legged stool. Uh, yep. We use the, the Venn diagram of business technology user or business technology design. But you unpack another metaphor that um, really maybe promotes a little bit more on diversity and inclusion. It promotes um, differences. It, it promotes a, a spectrum of possibilities. Uh, if, if you can, um, if you can unpack that. I, I, yeah. I never liked the three, the, the Venn diagram, the three circles, just because, you know, it's a point in time. Yep. Um, and I think that this, uh, this is really profound. So uh, yeah, some similar thinking. And again, as I'm going talking about this, uh, there was a tight line we walked between theory and practice, and we wanted people to see. We wanted the reader when you walk away to see the application of all this, because it really does change everything you do um, in across many many domains. And so one of the examples we talked about with associations was let's let's scrutinize through this lens what's useful and what's not useful about the three-legged stool, which is. It's been around for a few decades now, and it's the whole idea that there's three legs, technology, business, user experience. And I critique it and say it assumes that all are equal at all times. It begs the question, which I've seen debated in organization, who is the seat, right? <laughs> who, who sits there? Um, different people have different claims. It's also very exclusive. Like each leg is its own thing, unique and different from the others. And um, it, what's good about the metaphor is it's about balancing these different perspectives and concerns, which I think is, is brilliant. It's good at that but it just has all this baggage with it. So a step up, I would say, is the, the Venn diagram example of the whole thing where you talk about, okay, we're not that exclusive. We do have some overlap and in interests, some shared concern, but we still bring a different set of values or a different perspective. And I feel this is better, and I've used this for many years, but most recently I arrived at a different analogy, which was that of a spotlight. And the whole point being, uh, I started, it, it's just in my everyday interaction, started realizing there were programmers who were more like designers than some of the designers or people that design titles. There were um, designers who were more engineering of an engineering mindset and some of the engineers I worked with and same for product managers and business folks. And just the lines got really blurry. Um, and it actually, you know, I started questioning, is there even a value to these unique perspectives? And at the end of the day, I, I arrived at the conclusion, yes, there are these different vantage points that a company has to value for a product to be successful and balance, you know, business, human, technical concerns. But the analogy I like better was that of spotlights. And so if you look at this metaphor, then you can say, okay, there's a design mindset spotlight on the problem. There's an engineering mindset spotlight on the problem and there's a business mindset spotlight. And so right away, you see that we're all looking at the same thing, but from a different perspective. So I like that. And it focuses on what we share in common. It starts there, what are our shared concerns? Um, but then, you know, if you add a little shapes to it, and you can see in the lower right corner, I've done that here. Maybe the triangle is the design mindset, but you can see a triangle there that's halfway between engineer and designer, right? And it represents that that particular individual um, has a blend of these different mindsets. And that's great. That's okay, right? And you can see the designer who's actually more of a business mindset than anything else over in the, the lower right corner. And again, I like this metaphor and I shared it with the team I was working at um, a couple of years ago and, and they started riffing on it and building on it and saying, hey, wow, you could, it's almost like um, the, the old TVs where you had to project the three colors. And if you didn't, like the colors are off. So you need all three colors and, and you could add a fourth spotlight, a fourth different mindset on this. You could, you could mix and match, like just like you control lighting in, a, in an event, you could decide for this, sequence of the experience. We actually need less of this mindset, more of this. So 
seeing people run with the metaphor and seeing how it was open and expansive like, just really thrilled me. And again, the point of the book isn't to, um, you know, there's tons of stories, tons of examples like this, but it's to step back and say, let's think critically about the metaphors that we've just, you know, adopted and used without perhaps thinking more critically about them and how do they help and how do they hinder our own thinking. And I think that's extremely powerful to shift the, the metaphor. Um, and, and, you know, it's, I, I don't want to give people the, the impression that this is all theoretical. There's a huge amount of practical application throughout the book. Um, and, you know, I, I think you, you did an interesting exercise um, taking sort of visual design of both the flat two-dimensional plane while also incorporating time and space. Mm -hmm. uh, you did this with the calendar. Can, oh, you, yeah. can, can you talk a little bit about what you did with the calendar? Yeah. Um, so a little context and I'll, I'll pull up the, the calendar uh, presentation. So there's a section in the book where I'm talking about things like, um, again, these kind of abstract ideas, like how we place things, how we think about time. Uh, you know, in Western cultures, we then tend to think of time as moving from you know, left to right. Um, that's not the same in other cultures. And again, why? It's the associations we have with language and writing at a deeper level. Um, so I I'm talking all about this and then I said, okay, let's, let's put a face on this again to make it relevant, to help us think through things. And what I shared was actually a personal example I created for myself and maybe someday I'll actually create a digital startup that does this <laughs> for everyone. But um, do, you, do you have Andy the, the, the page for that? It's two, page 204. Um, no. uh, figure number, maybe? Figure 9.2. There we go. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is my calendar from a few years ago. And actually, I have versions now that have more colors and encodings. But um, when I started looking about how I use a calendar or how I need to, particularly for, not for like, in a week, but across a year. So planning speaking events, planning uh, weekend campouts with the scouts, things like that. Uh, I first, I shifted my calendar week to be Monday through Sunday, um, just so it'd make more sense. Like if you're going on a, on a retreat this weekend, then why would you use a calendar that was Saturday is at the end of the line and Sunday begins the new. It's easier to see that as a continuous block if it's over the weekend. So having lots of weekend events, again, like campouts or retreats, it made sense to group Saturday and Sunday together. Um, there was something else too that's always frustrated me about physical calendars. And for whatever reason, this carried over into many of the digital calendars, which is, let's say um, it's the end of the month and the end of the month's on Wednesday. We can't actually see what's on Thursday, which ha may happen to be like tomorrow, right? Or two days from now, unless we change our whole view. And so that always bugged me and frustrated me. So I got rid of the whole, um, you have to flip to the next calendar to see what's right in front of you. And so you see this continuous calendar that runs for the entire year. Um, so I can see just sweeping where things are at. And this helps because I think there are many cases where we think that date is way out in the future. And then by seeing it in this sort of view, we're actually just say, oh, wow, that's in two weeks, right? Or that's a week from now. And so it just, just this visualization, which I um, actually created in Keynote and maintained there um, and still do, I create, keep a version of this, has helped with, um, just planning at a broad stroke um, a lot of the events I've, I've committed to. Um, you can see this is a year where I was doing a lot of speaking, a lot of traveling, um, but more recent versions I've had public, was one public speaking events was one color. I have a different color for private events and then a third color for family personal events. Um, and it's just a good way to keep track of things at a broad level. So when someone says, we're doing an event in September, can you, can you give a keynote? I can look at it and see, well, I could, but I'm giving a keynote I had a weekend before and that's just going to be too stressful, right? Or whatever it may be. I, I, I like how you've paired the, the meaning that we as humans make into the calendar rather than using sort of the structure imposed on our experience. And, and I think that, that speaks to the book as a whole, right? Of there are these structures that we've either grown up with or acclimatized ourselves to, to thinking in those modes and you really try to dislodge our, our thinking mechanisms, the calendar being sort of a common example, right? We, in order for everybody to get here on time, we had to follow some kind of, some kind of structure in order to, to, to get here. But that's not necessarily the meaning that we take out of it, which is so profound. Um, 
we, you do talk a lot about visual perception and uh, the Gestalt principles that designers are very familiar with. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, not everybody is, a, a designer may be good at designing interfaces or, or, or things, um, posters or three-dimensional objects, but may not always be good at visual thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Designing visuals doesn't necessarily make one inherently good at uh, visual thinking. Can you talk about the barriers that hold back visual thinking that you discuss in the book? Yeah, um, there are three. I'm gonna see if I can remember them from memory. You may have to help me with the third one. Uh, so it's interesting, yeah, because there's a distinct, there's a difference between like being able to create really nice, beautiful things and actually embrace visual thinking. And if you look at um, what's being done with concept models that I've created in the past, or you look at what uh, uh, my friend Christina Wood Woodkey wrote about in her book, Pencil Me In, it's not about artistic skill or expression or design craft skill at all. It's about thinking through the use of space or a thicker line or a thinner line or all these things that are really about visual encodings and use of space, which is what uh, this book talks about. And so um, after going through a lot of examples and a lot of everyday examples, like I talk about uh, how we use space um, with salt and pepper shakers and a friend explaining something. I talk about how we use space uh, when we use laundry bins, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm showing how these things are universal. And it begs the question then why, if these are so natural, like if we're good at organizing our closets or our pantries, why can't we create um, a good concept model around an abstract idea? Like why will people pay for a, a workshop I'll teach on that very topic? And one of the conclusions I reached in writing the book, and again, lots of learning, it was a learning journey for me, was uh, if it's a literal, physical, tangible thing, like I want you to sort, out, sort all the kids by height, right? We can do that, no problem. But when the moment it becomes something less tangible, more of an abstract concept, like I want you to arrange employees based on this um, uh, performance and potential matrix, right? The nine buck. Suddenly it's, it's more difficult, it's more challenging because it's a squishy thing. And so I think that's the one barrier is learning to treat these fuzzy concepts, just like you would treat physical concepts, but actually reframe them and, and think of them as such. Uh, the, actually the third one came to mind. Now you'll have to fill in the gap with the second one. The, the third one was we tend to confuse pretty pictures and making things really uh, decoratively visu visual with visual thinking. And those are, those are different things. And I use an example of uh, just a, a classic sketch note. Like I love sketch noting, sketch noting is great. But what's often missing from sketch notes is the use of space to hold meaning. So again, if we put something on a matrix or we line something up on a grid, where things are positioned has meaning. But with sketch notes, um, that's not the focus. In fact, some sketch editors will say, don't worry about, you know, the, where things are placed. It's just about recall, like having illustrations to, to reinforce concepts and move people through a narrative, perhaps. But like having people play things placed, like you're sketch journey in real time. You don't have time to think about where placement or what placement means. So that's, that was the third point. And do you, can you remind me what the second one is or where that is in the book? Yeah, so the, the second one is over-reliance on a few existing models. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this is probably the biggest hurdle is where you say we get interested in visual thinking. And I, I found this in my own workshops. Um, a lot of us just naturally yearn for the simple tool, like teach me the tools so I can go go use it. Um, and I, you know, it, it's, it's made the made what I do harder to market, but I've, I've drawn a line for years, which is, yeah, I can show you the tools and how to use it, but then like a recipe, you'll only know how to make those recipes or use those tools. Let's go deeper. Um, so I put a slide up in the beginning, like I personally don't currently understand spices and herbs and how to mix them and what proportions, I would like to understand that. So as it is, I'm handicapped to recipes. And maybe if I make enough dozens or hundreds of recipes, I'll start to internalize the, the deeper patterns. But at this point, I don't have understanding in that space. And I would say the same thing happens with um, visual thinking. If all you ever use are you know, the bar charts that are pre-incorporated in Excel or the Venn diagram or cons uh, mental, model, mental map, that we learned to draw in like grade school or something. Um, those, are, those are our tools, that's what we know. And so I quite frequently like to pull back, dig deeper and say, well, why does the Venn diagram work, right? What is it showing, right? What, what about the overlap and the shared, like let's think about this at a deeper level. And so um, that, that's the thing I challenge is like digging deeper, looking for those fundamental patterns. And I think that that chapter actually sets up the next chapter where I talk about what those fundamental patterns are that are um, behind nearly every visual representation. 
Um, in fact, I'll just share something quickly. And the, uh, the visual thinking workshop I do, I actually open it with, um, I have a collection of a really broad range of visual examples. So everything from what you would expect, like data visualizations and graphs and charts, right? But then also have things like menus. Like there's this menu from Japan where they put the, uh, the different sake options on the, on the grid, right? And I, just this wide ranging thing, an, an app where the app uh, helps you, you know, track your progress on things, right? And I give every table like about 20 of these. So every table is a different set. And I ask them first to organize and sort these things to look for a pattern. And that's just a, it's a warm up. It's to start to talk about how we organize things. And then I introduce a framework or a model. And I have everyone uh, from those tables go and put those visual representations on the wall. And then the mic drop moment. Behind every one of these visual representations, I'm gonna tell you what the underlying grammar is, what's universal across these. And if you can learn that and master that, then you can adapt and modify any tool you want. And just to put a face on this, given we have a lot of designers, service designers, UX designers, um, I see this where there's a yearning to be taught what's the right way to do a customer journey or a service blueprint or these things. Um, and we'll spend books and take courses on that. When at the end of the day, if we peel back the layers, with many of these models, it's time on one axis, right? And then there's channels or, or modes on the other. And if you can get back to that layer, then you can tweak and modify those tools and you can use the tools rather than being used by the tools. Um, so that's, a, that's something, a, a mindset I'm, I think I'm, I'm devoted to challenging with folks. So I wanna to go to some questions from the chat uh, window here. <clears throat> um, we had a question earlier. Uh, about how do I think the question's asking how do I simplify my UX firm's offering to attract enterprise customers who need UX? Um, they have a team, but they want to help their help focusing their team. And I think the question that's being asked is building the right thing versus building the thing right. Mm -hmm. um, can you try to try to help um, guide that individual? Yeah, so I think I would need more to answer. So I'm gonna answer what I think the question's asking, but I could be completely wrong. Um, if it really is like a marketing a pitch or communication, then uh, uh, I mean, you're getting into narratives and framing. There actually it touches on a lot of things. So one, very tactically, you could talk about the page and the layout and the presentation, the visual design, the aesthetic parts of that. But more fundamentally, uh, I learned to have a deeper appreciation for all the associations that certain styles and aesthetics evoke and even language you use. Um, so quick example, I was speaking with a friend of mine who owns an agency, it's been very successful, it's grown from him to now 30 people, um, but they brought on someone recently and they're trying to grow into more of an enterprise space. And the, this guy comes from New York, has done a lot of big sales and he's like, you need to drop the agency moniker. Like agency is putting you in a box, you're not gonna be able to, to move beyond where you wanna go. Um, if you don't stop calling yourself an agency. Again, we could debate whether he's right or wrong, but that's a perspective with experiences and it's, it's good to factor in. Um, I think the same thing would translate to, um, there's all sorts of trappings that go along with like appealing to enterprise. One, like you don't show your price, right? It's quicker to, you know, to contact the salesperson, which for me, for lot, I'm looking for a lot of self-service tools, but I'm not the market, right? I'm not the enterprise person. Um, sometimes the visual aesthetic is kind of dated or has these stock photo images, but that's, I think, going back to knowing your audience. And for me, again, if I dig deeper, it's about knowing the prior associations that that audience, that enterprise buyer is used to and looking for and what feels safe and comfortable to them. So if they're used to being pitched by all these big companies who play it very safe and have these very boring, as designers, we would call them boring uh, stock images. Um, if we truly are taking a user perspective, then we would say, well, that's the language that this person speaks. And those are, that's, the, that's what's gonna appeal to them and make them feel safe with my offerings. Again, a lot more I think we could dig into, but those are some, some top of mind things. There's a sort of circling back to one of the things that you mentioned about the calendar. Somebody noted, I would rather be pregnant nine months than 280 days. Uh, and, and they noted that you're pregnant 40 weeks and sort of the different ways that, that you can do that. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you can think about that. Um, and I think Scott uh, is mentioning hand skills versus templates and asked the question of how do we balance thinking and doing, mm -hmm. uh, thinking versus doing. I, 
I would wonder if it's a dichotomy like that. I think there's, I tend to talk about thinking through doing. In fact, a big, a big foundation set up for the book is the whole idea that, um, yeah, we think through actions and think through doing. I think for me personally, this goes back to a Montessori upbringing where like they didn't have us open a, a book to learn about fractions. They had us like cut uh, those Velveeta slices of cheese, like cheese into quarters and then cut those, you know, cut them in, uh, again. And we were learning fractions, right? Um, or counting deeds. And, and uh, there's so much from Montessori, like the tangible aspects, the interactive aspects, the experiential learning. And we were backing into these concepts, but um, very much a learning by doing or learning through doing uh, a mindset, which when we talk about interactions and we talk about moving the Scrabble tiles or um, uh, one of the exercises we do in our workshop is, you know, you have a bunch of coins in front of you and you're asked to as quickly as possible um, count how many, what the, the total amount is of the coins you have, right? And, but you have to sit on your hands. And we time people and a lot of people, they, the errors are off and then they get a chance to do it again. And of course, everyone interacts with, like you sort by pennies, or you stack things and it's, we think through interactions. And so I think that's a big theme that comes throughout, throughout the book. Um, even near the end where we start talking about teams, we start, start going beyond the level of the individual and we talk about groups. We talk about the value of, you don't bring 10 people in a room so you can blast them with a lecture. You bring 10 people in a room so you can have a dialogue and a conversation but that doesn't happen by happenstance. It has to be designed for and coordinated. You have to have um, the right tools and the right things. You have sticky notes you know, in the room, right, ready to use. Um, even things like, you know, is the table a sit down table or is it designed to be standing high? Because that encourages sitting up, standing down. Is there whiteboards on the wall? Are there no whiteboards? Like what kind of dialogue and thinking does that facilitate? Great, great answer. It, it, it's interesting that you say that because I, I was I was mentioning to you earlier. I've just been re uh, reconfiguring my office. I always have a little bit of play doh on my desk in order to when I'm thinking through a hard problem, I'll just not even consciously reach for it to to sort of let my hands do some 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 working. Um, so Brian asks the question of what what did you learn while writing the book, and um, did any of your thoughts change? And I. I uh, I know we talked about this a little bit earlier, but um, maybe to add on to that, were there, was there anything that, left, was, that was left out of the book that you, <laughs> that, that you had to cut out? Yeah, so um, definitely learned a lot um, along the way. Uh, the biggest learnings weren't so much aha surprise moments, though there were a few of those. The biggest learnings were in, uh, it was almost like writing this book was a puzzle where I kept trying to restructure and organize it to find the, the narrative or the model that fit. Um, that seemed right. And so I, so I think looking and kicking at these ideas, because um, I think as you comment in your email, like I cover a breadth of things, right? It's a lot of domains. So the toughest thing was uh, how to efficiently tackle all these in a way that's organized. So that, that would be the biggest learnings. And then there were smaller learnings along the way. Um, there were several moments where I'd like written the first draft of a chapter and then I was digging into the research that I was citing. And as I started digging in more, um, the research really didn't support everything I'd written, um, and it would. And the side, I don't know there were lots. I think I went on a tw Twitter rant about a year ago, where I talked about my frustration with academic research, where we'll hear these studies or we hear the headline or even see it cited in a book, and we'll hold to it like it's it's an amazing thing. And as we dig into the research, oftentimes it says um, the the statistical significance was not what the headlines reported, right? It wasn't quite as strong. You look into the sample size and it was like, oh yeah, a professor's classroom, you know, over two semesters, right? And you're like, oh, who, who, it was, there was no selection bias in there, right? And no like small sample sizes. Um, and I'm speaking more about like social sciences types of research and behavioral economics things. Um, so I didn't want to perpetuate uh, things that are myths or things, studies that are having a hard time with rep replicability. Um, replication. And so like when we talk about priming and anchoring, uh, we, it fits with the whole narrative of associations and it, it fits the narrative and the model that we're proposing. But we were quick to, quick to throw in a disclaimer that says, hey, some of these studies, have, they've had trouble with replication and we're including it here, but like, you know, don't go including it in your next talk as proof. <laughs> like, cause it's, and so we wanted to be very transparent about that um, without undermining the broader points. I think, I think I would argue are consistently shared. Um, 
I feel like in answering your question, I went off on, on a detour, but. <laughs> It's, it's, it's great. I, I, are you doing anything with any of that information that has been cut out that you weren't able to include? Oh, is that going on? Yeah, yeah. So i um, glad you asked that. The, <laughs> there was, so one, the poster that uh, uh, Cassini referenced earlier, it's, it's something I, I don't think I've ever seen an author do. So I had the book structurally went through lots of changes over the time I wrote it. And so I took the time to actually create a poster uh, it's quite a wide poster, but it walks through the major structural evolutions over time. So you can see how chapters moved or shifted, um, sometimes got cut, sometimes got added, sometimes chapters split, and like one half went in the trash bin, the other half got merged with another chapter. So it's this nice uh, timeline where you can see all that. And again, that's in the, there's a video introduction on Vimeo that um, I think you put in the link earlier, and then you can download the PDF. So that's, that's one thing. But there was one intact chapter that we cut Right, right near the end. We cut right before we send it out for a reader review, just because it didn't quite fit the, the narrative structure of the book. And it was, um, it was a hard cut because it was this uh, classification of seven types of understanding problems. And uh, we'd gotten a lot of great feedback when we shared this um, in workshops. In fact, um, uh, uh, a good colleague uh, who I admire a lot said, this model you shared uh, was worth the price of the workshop alone. This model alone was worth the price of the workshop. So it was really hard years later to like cut that when you have that kind of feedback. But again, it just didn't fit. So um, we are, uh, I am going to do something here in the next few days, uh, working, still working out the details with uh, Rosenfeld Media, my publisher, but we're going to, for people who want to write a review on Amazon, and again, the goal is awareness. We want people to be aware of this. Um, if they just send us a screen, send me a screenshot of the review. And again, it could be a five-star review. It could be a one-star review. The point with Amazon and gaming their system is just to get reviews. Um, but if you write a review, um, send an email, a screenshot, and I will send out that missing chapter. Um, plus some, uh, like, uh, there's a section on interaction patterns. So we actually have a, a card deck we've used in our workshops where each, each interaction pattern is a, is a, a card. So there's some goodies. Think of it like the uh, extras on a Blu-ray disc. Um, so we'll send you that if you write a review. Fantastic. And um, I love that you include it. It can be any star review <laughs> as well. It, it's, it's really quite a, 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 an excellent book. Um, there's so many resources and frameworks here. Um, we had a question um, uh, regarding what, what tools do you use when writing your books? <laughs> so here's what's interesting. Um, you talk to most writers, there's not one tool that works for everything. So everything for me personally starts with the Bear app. It's a Mac iOS only app, but um, all of my notes, all of my organizations through Bear. And so I start there. Uh, and once something is coherent enough that it's not just scraps and notes and um, I want to get feedback, I usually go into Google Docs because um, Google Docs just there commenting is really great and the way it handles it, it's just, just perfect. You know, it was built from the ground up to be a, a shared social tool, um, something I actually comment on in the book. Uh, so that's usually the second stage. And then for good technical reasons that I had to learn, um, publishers won't, can't or have trouble getting from Google Docs to, to print files. And so um, you need to work in Word and Word actually has some good uh, functional advantages for publishing. Um, so usually those three tools for writing. Uh, and then, of course, a notebook. Um, and as I, I talk about in the book, like I think even these tools, they force a certain kind of thinking where you have to, um, there are some pros and cons. So the fact that I can cut and paste and move and interact with a document, I do that a lot. Like if you could watch me writing one paragraph, it would, it's not like line, it's not like watching a typewriter. It's very different. <laughs> There's a lot of dialogue you could see, um, mental dialogue I'm, I'm having with the page. But even at that, um, that doesn't compare to being able to pick up a pen and a blank sheet of paper and draw arrows between things and move things around and have this much more free form organic way. And so I usually go back and forth and there's no first or second. It's just, there's this interplay between the free range of drawing ideas and the typing them and the nuance of being able to finesse those and going back and exploring those. So I would include drawing on a blank sheet of paper as part of the writing process, very much so. Here is a really beautiful tool. I, I, I stole that one from you. I always tell my students, if you stole something from me, you stole it twice, and that, that I stole from you. 
Um, I like that. <laughs> Michael asks, um, have you derived or discovered any visual representation tools as an alternative to, to Venn diagrams or bar charts? Um, I think that's a really powerful question. And you, you kind of talk about that in the last half of your book. Yeah. Um, so again, the book addresses some of the fundamental, like think of it as like Lego bricks that we can put together in many ways. Um, though I do, um, I'm trying to remember if it made it into the book or not. Uh, there's a number of models that have become a go-to for my thinking. So we all have like a continuum, right? And we all have like matrix and Venn diagrams. Those are pretty common. Um, I'm going to just kind of draw this out. But for me, as I'm exploring ideas, again, the content's driving the representation. But there's this visual that started showing up a lot for me where um, a continuum's too simple with a matrix forces an unnecessary fourth thing. So I'll often draw like a triangle and talk about things. And I'll draw, I'll cut the triangle in half to talk about stuff the one thing that's above that has this common characteristic and the two things below that have this common characteristic. Um, that's become a pattern that's a go-to for me that I don't see used very often. Um, yeah, it varies, um, but that's actually, that's actually one of the things I uh, do in my workshops is walk through, like, let's start with a concept. And I think I started with something simple like uh, tidy uh, versus disorganized, right? Which the more you start, you, sketching that as binary, you realize there's a spectrum, and then you realize, well, wait, why are those things a spectrum? That's wrong. You put down a matrix and you refine your language. And there's this whole process we go through to refine our thinking as we have an interplay with how we're representing our thinking in a visual way. Yeah, I, I like this question from Felipe. Um, is there a difference between modeling for your own understanding versus modeling for understanding of others? Wow. <sighs> So, yes and no. Um, I would think if you become aware of the process that you do for yourself, um, I would say it's, I would aspire to externalize that process and include others. And what I'm pushing back there, uh, pushing on, is our tendency to work things out for ourselves and then try to communicate or broadcast or convince others. And the invitation that I would extend is if we can externalize our own thinking process and bring people into that, then we all think together and we arrive at the conclusion together. So that's the thing I would challenge. Um, that said, uh, there are certain shortcuts and processes we've internalized just as human beings where it makes sense to think alone before we bring it to others. But again, I would go back to that. Any way you can externalize that process and bring people into it, um, you're going to end up on the other side so much better. And this is whether you're working out a difficult, complex problem or like, I don't know, like scientists trying to find a cure to COVID, right? And sharing information. And we have a history of, of cures being, um, uh, uh, breakthroughs happening when there's open sharing of knowledge, right? Which is something I value. Um, but if you talk about like, a, I don't know, the classic divide between designers and engineers, right? And it's often because we don't work together on these things. And then there's the, how do I convince, right? Or how do I throw this over the wall and get it done right? where more successfully, if you can get teams working together and there's a shared understanding of the problem and why that was designed this certain way or why it's hard to build it out this way, like the, the end results are so much better. Fantastic. I know we're, we're on the hour here. Uh, we'll go over a couple of minutes. Uh, if folks are able to stay on, fantastic. I know uh, if you've got a meeting to, to get to, we will record this. Um, so you'll be able to, to catch uh, these last sessions. We'll send out a link to the recording afterwards. And a quick, quick interruption um, for the, some of the questions that you were asked. If, if your question was asked, if you can shoot Cassini um, your email address, uh, you can private message him. We'll get you a free copy of the book. Yeah, so if I asked your, um, if I asked your question, uh, you get a free copy of Stephen's book. What a nice guy. He was going to actually hand drop this to my house. Uh, uh, I don't know if you'll be doing that for everybody, but um, <laughs> uh, this, is, this is fantastic. Um, maybe a couple final questions here. I, I think um, uh, I, th I think your last uh, point about thinking together versus alone you, I learned something from the book that I wasn't familiar with before, which is distributed cognition. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I guess I come from the embodied cognition school, right, uh, as, as well. And, you know, there's this notion of uh, in, in universities where we graduate people individually versus as a group. Right? Yep. We often think better in, in, in groups. Can you, can you just unpack what will, um, 
what distributed cognition is and how it, it helps us to figure it out? It, it's a slight variation of the last question, but yep. I'd like to pull that out a little bit more. In 60 seconds, right? In 60 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh gosh. So, um, and there's different phrases and different lens. The, act, the group cognition phrase is actually from a, a specific line of research that um, I'm totally going to butcher the name, Stahl, S-T-A-H-L, I think has been doing. But the idea is um, that Stahl proposes, and I use group distributed, sorry, there's group cognition and distributed cognition. So distributed cognition is a broader term. I'll come back to that. Group cognition is the work of um, Stahl. Um, and Stahl is talking about using technology to bring people together to share ideas. But again, there's these underpinnings of, um, if you think about how our brains work, right, with all these neurons and associations wiring and firing together, um, how much more powerful would it be if we could model or simulate something like that between us? So now instead of your thoughts, Cassini, and my thoughts, um, it's our thoughts collectively and how much better could we be if we could you know, intermingle those. So that's kind of the idea of the, the group cognition. Distributed cognition is really about um, moving away from this brain bound idea that uh, thinking happens in the head and embracing the idea that thinking happens um, in and through our interactions with the world and in the world itself. So when we make a note to ourselves and pin a stick on the wall, we're using that environment to hold an idea in place so we don't forget it later on. And so learning to view our environment and even other people in the room as part of the distributed cognitive system, or I think we call it a, a system of cognitive resources, that's a powerful way to reframe things. It, it changed how I looked at workshops and facilitation um, where it became less about me delivering a masterclass or performing and more about bringing people together into a dialogue where everyone emerged learning so much more, myself included. I think that's such an important lesson for designers uh, to, to learn. Un unfortunately, we, we couldn't get to everybody's question, um, but Stephen, I have one last one for you. Um, I've been hearing some buzz about Mighty Minds. Is this, you have a superhero cape underneath that shirt? What is, what is Mighty Minds? We all have a superhero cape. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, in it, the launch of the beta, private beta, I've been talking about it for some months, but it is imminent. I'm just trying to work out some, some kinks with the billing system and setting up the learning tool. But basically, um, I'm forming a, a, a community called the Mighty Minds Club, um, and I'm pitching it as a method of the month club. We'll go deep with one particular method that will help product teams uh, uh, embrace, work through, have dialogue around a difficult situation. Uh, and in many ways, it's kind of the natural progression of the book, right? And talking about the value of canvases or card decks or these things to think with for bringing people together into dialogue around different conversations. And so um, I actually fell into a position over the last several years where I was curating and sharing these types of tools with teams. And um, um, I want to create a community where I can do that more broadly with the world, really. And so we'll be looking at things from um, things like polarity mapping. So when you have two tensions and it's not an either or, but kind of a both and paradox, how do you get teams to talk about that? So a classic one between, uh, uh, often between business and uh, within product teams is um, do we move fast and break things, ship quickly and learn, or do we be thoughtful and do some upfront research and plan? And there's no right or wrong. There's no either or, it's a both and, it's a paradox. So uh, polarity mapping facilitates that. Um, there's a card deck that I developed on how to spot bad problem statements so you don't run down the road solving the wrong problem. Um, just a whole bunch of things like that. And what we'll do is go deep as a community every month on one of these tools. Wow. So that should be launching imminently, but you can go to the mightymindsclub.com and you'll get uh, the email, like I said, in the next, in a matter of days about the private beta. And the private beta will be $1. So one dollar, right, to to get in. So it's uh, even if you decide later on not to join at the full price for the first three months, one buck, right? And there's no no sort of like we got your credit cards. We're gonna none of that crap. It's just pay one dollar, be a part of a community. It helps me learn and figure out what um, what would work best and where the interests are. I love that. That's that sounds like a natural extension of the book. The, the Mighty Minds Club is very much a, a, an extension of the book. Um, well, thank you very much, Stephen, for, for joining for this Q&A. Thank you, everybody who participated, who stayed. Um, apologies that we went slightly over. Um, if you haven't already, uh, uh, message me in the chat window 
that uh, I, if I asked your question, please do. I, I'd like to get you a copy of Stephen's book. Um, and if you are interested in it, we'll send out a, a link to the book um, uh, afterwards, as well as the Mighty Minds Club. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, we will see you on the next one. Stephen, any final words? I'll go and figure it out together. Excellent. There was an exclamation point on that one. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, everybody.